everybody, and welcome to this lovely experience that I'm going to have here at Carytown talking about Mozart. Uh, when I was first invited to do this, the suggestion of Mozart came up, and I thought since this is the first time I'm doing this, and, and uh, uh, it would be fun to do the first time Mozart appeared in the world musically. Uh, this little piece that some of you, I bet you a lot of people recognized it, but some of you probably studied this as children, or if you came to the piano as adults, this was in an anthology book, but you probably recognized it, it sounds familiar. I'd like to tell you a little bit about it before we go on to the other pieces on the program today. This is a minuet and trio, and its catalog number, cataloger uh, Ludwig Kirchel, uh, organized all of Mozart's music in some kind of chronological order, and we still use this today. The catalog number on this is K1, pretty early. What you're hearing is a minuet and a trio. And I'd like to just explain that a little bit because this is a form of music, of organization of, of musical sections that goes on, was long before Mozart appeared, and goes on well into the 20th century as the way to write uh, a short movement in a symphony or sometimes a quartet. You have a beginning section in a tonic key, in this case G major. from tonic, home key, leave the key, go to the dominant. Then there's the second, and that section is repeated. Then there's the second section, which sounds a little bit out of the key. We're not sure where we are, but we quickly get back to the tonic key. And that section is repeated. So the first section is repeated, the second section is repeated, and then we have a contrasting section which has taken on the name of trio. It has nothing to do with being three of anything except this particular little piece. We do add another line of music. And the outer voices are a duet. The texture thickens, and because of that, I tend to play it a little bit louder, a little bit more uh, aggressively. And that starts in the tonic, but in a new key. This starts in C major. A little, a little squiggle variation. And moving to the dominant of C major. And that's repeated. Again, a little bit out of the key. Coming back. And back to the tonic of C major. And that's repeated. And then we go back to the minuet and play the whole minuet again without repeats. Now, that may sound a little complicated. I suspect that you could follow that, but I can very well remember my first year as a student at Juilliard. In our, in our classes with analysis, we had to write pieces like this, and there were a lot of students there who were very talented in their instruments or their voices, but had never studied form, even a simple form, and they had to learn this and they had to do compositions and have the teacher say, no, that, that, that doesn't go very well to the dominant key or something like that. And these were college students. Now the reason I'm telling you this, and you all, I'm sure, know this, that that little piece was written by 
that little Mozart who was five years old. He had never been to Juilliard, I promise you. And he had probably not had anything more than cursory commentary from his father, Leopold, who was an excellent teacher, a, a famed teacher, uh, a, a violinist and composer of more than, than, he was a significant composer. So maybe Leopold had said something to his little boy son as he was teaching uh, his daughter, Nannerl, actually the piano. Mozart did not have lessons. Mozart picked this up. And even though he went on, and you're going to hear a piece, a minuet that he wrote much later in his life that is astonishing, when he writes a minuet and trio, he doesn't change the, the organization of the movements. His symphonies that have four movements, the minuet and trio movements, are the same organization. He intuited this. He picked it up. Nobody taught him this. And that's one reason I think starting a program on Mozart with K1, even though it's a very easy piece, gives you an idea of what an incredible genius Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was. I can only imagine what Papa felt when he heard his little son who could barely look over the keyboard of what must have been a harpsichord doing or maybe he did it in perfect rhythm. Papa ran to the inkwell, took out a quill pen, and copied it down. And that's why we have a lot of Mozart's early, early pieces uh, collected and often anthologized. And I am quite sure that many of you listening have played this piece. Later on, by the, the, the date, by the way, would have been 1762, 61, it appears in the catalog as 1762, but maybe he hadn't had his sixth birthday yet. I don't know. I want to play for you another piece, also a minuet. This is, for me, one of the most astonishing pieces that Mozart wrote. It's not very long, and it's not exactly hard, but it is fascinating, the, the chromaticism that is in this piece is just, it, it, it sounds more like something that Berlioz or maybe Strauss would have written. Now let me explain chromaticism just a little bit. If we play a scale, we call that diatonic, those are the notes of the scale. If we fill in those whole steps with the half step, that chromatic, all half steps. And when you have those notes juxtaposed, the chromatic half steps, it, it can be dissonant. It can be somewhat shocking to hear those tones. Here is a little piece by the mature Mozart. There is actually some disagreement as to when this was written. I'm going to say somewhere in the 1780s. And Kirchl gives it a different K number than the chronology would, ex would, would suggest. We don't know exactly when it was written, but more importantly, we don't know why. Why would a composer who was writing operas and symphonies and quartets and answering to commissions and writing liturgical music and, and popular music in order to bring in some money, why would he have written this little piece that I'm about to play?
That's not praising me. That's assuring you that that's what Mozart wrote. And again, I'd like to talk about this for just a little bit. There are some chords in here that really look ahead to the middle of the 19th century as chords that would be common to a musical texture and harmony. Just listen to the first sound. Second sound. We call that an augmented chord. We used to joke about it and say it was a demented chord. It was a funny joke when you're 18. It's not so funny now, but it sounds... When you're sight reading this piece for the first time, you really question your ability to sight read. Did Mozart write this? Really? Why? Upset stomach? What? What mode? We don't know. We don't have the slightest information about why in the middle of writing operas and symphonies and, as I said, answering to commissions and uh, before his fortunes had really started to sink, uh, I'm, I'm placing this around 1785, but, but that's just picking a number. But he, for some reason, he took the time out of his schedule to notate this strange piece. So we have this augmented chord. These harmonies are what we call passing harmonies. They are momentarily dissonant and then they resolve to something consonant. But they are so in advance of any harmonic language that he had used before so consistently Sounds like something maybe he got from Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, <clears throat> but I don't know. And again, the chromaticism. to another. By now, if you were taking an ear training test, you'd have a great understanding of what an augmented chord sounds like, all major thirds. And then he has the audacity to tell us, I'm just making a joke. juxtaposition of the 19th century, the later 19th century, and something that is almost infantile is astonishing, absolutely astonishing. And yet here is Mozart making it work. To me, that this piece, this piece is a miracle. I want to look at the second half again, just a little bit to give you an idea of, of, of what's happening. Really, Louis, check your notes. That can't be right. Yeah, that's right. Oh, come on. Then he's going to prolong the, the tension. And he's going to change the rhythm. Instead of three beats to a measure, now we're going to have two beats. opening part again, but now he's got to stay in the key, so he gives you a whole new set of augmented chords. And again, I was just joking.
I think this is just a little tiny molecule of a miracle. I love to play this piece, and I, I remember the first time I played it, it was, it was uh, not a concert, it was for some friends at home, and I tried it out, and they, they couldn't believe it. And the first time I read it, I couldn't believe it either. It's a gem. Now those two pieces, that's a minuet, by the way, there's no trio to that. But those two pieces kind of encapsulate his ability to write lovely diatonic music at age five and write incredibly chromatic music at times throughout his career. And the next two pieces I'm going to play are combinations of that diatonic beauty and the chromatic tension that pervades the major works of Mozart. The next two pieces are concert pieces. I, frankly, I've played them here in, in Carytown, I, I think at least twice. I can remember two occasions, and I've, uh, I never get tired. The next piece to me, of all of the short keyboard pieces that Mozart wrote, and there are many, there are many other than the sonatas and concertos and variations, this piece perhaps is the most miraculous the most beautiful, the most haunting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it and then follow it up with a, a, a very popular piece that I think all of you will recognize. So the next two, uh, the next two pieces I consider almost like a slow movement and a fast movement, uh, almost like a mini sonata. What's unusual about the B minor adagio? I just said, he never used the term adagio happily. He said one time in a letter, play my adagios on Dante. So why didn't he write it on Dante? I'm just the messenger, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know why. But B minor, here's what's amazing about B minor. Other than the slow movement of the flute and string quartet early in his career, which is a lovely, lovely, wonderful movement. He never used the key of B minor. And this piece appears in the Kirchhoff catalog as having been written on March 19th. 17, I think 1785 is the year. I'll, I'll check my score. 1788, sorry. 1788, March 19th. Now, Either he composed it or it appeared, but the biographies suggest that he wrote this piece one day. Again, why? Why did he write this? What was going through his mind when he wrote it? And what goes through the performer's mind when he or she plays it? I can't answer to Mozart, but I can answer to what goes through my mind that there is and I played it many times, and I never, never get tired of, number one, hearing it. I never fail to find some new thing in it and some slightly different way to do something that I had done before. It is a piece that is continually being composed in my own mind as I play it. The harmonies are radiantly beautiful, and again, the chromaticism is so striking. Usually we go from minor key to relative major, and he does do that. Development sections usually modulate by what we call the circle of fifths, going from, from uh, This particular development section modulates chromatically from G major down to F sharp minor, up to G minor, up to A minor, up to the note A sharp, which becomes the leading tone back to B. You don't, I mean, no exam, you don't have to worry about remembering that, but the modulation scheme is, it, it, it looks ahead to composers like Mahler. It really does. Uh, 
and the recapitulation where you come back. This, this movement, by the way, is an adagio title, but it's in sonata form, where you have a first and second tonal center and a development section and a recapitulation. He saves the greatest surprise, the most beautiful moment, and I'm gonna gush, forgive me, in all of the Mozart solo piano music, he saves the most beautiful touching moment for the end of the adagio. I'm not gonna give it away. Uh, I, I, I hope it will come across when you hear it. The rondo, the D major rondo, which was somewhat earlier, uh, the 1786 or something like that, has a curious uh, genesis. He used it, he used it earlier in the uh, G minor piano quartet. Uh, a work, by the way, which four of us, my daughter and two wonderful friends of hers and I played on our driveway on Sunday afternoon uh, on an electric piano that a neighbor loaned us. We played through that quartet to the, to the uh, fascination of our neighbors. And we get to this... Uh <laughs> He used that theme in the quartet, but he stole that theme from his teacher when he, when Mozart was eight years old, he had some lessons with Johann Christian Bach who used that theme in a flute quintet. So this theme has traveled. And it's just a descending scale. And that's pretty much what you hear in the entire piece. And this piece is in sonata form too. And he gets enormous mileage out of it. And there is some chromaticism in this piece too. But it's such a joy to hear and it's so happy as opposed to the D minor adagio which is so deeply personal and melancholy. So I'd like to play these two pieces for you as a pair, as a unit.
I can't think of a happier piece to play in this happiest of environments than playing the D major rondo in Carytown, Carytown Concert House, where I personally have had some of the happiest moments of my career right here in Ann Arbor, making music to audiences and friends and myself. I have to tell you, I had so much fun playing those two pieces. Fun is not exactly what you have in the adagio, but the pathos of the adagio, followed by the air clearing, the, the purity and the transparency of that rondo. It really reflects back on that little K1 and then the, the, uh, the D major rondo that he wrote later in his life. Here Mozart is juxtaposing the deepest melancholy pathos for reasons that remain unknown. He took, he took the reason for that piece to his grave. And this rondo, which may have been the intended, intended last movement of a sonata, or we, again, we don't know why he wrote some of these short pieces, but they show the vast emotional range that Mozart had. I, I can say this without any fear of argument, that Mozart would have been happy as he could be playing those two pieces here in this auditorium, in this, in this hall, in this room at Carytown. So thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. And I do want to end today's program on a different note. Uh, all of us listening appreciated the great American Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who passed away, we know that. And I'd like to play a short, totally different period, intermezzo by Brahms, in honor of her, in appreciation of her. This is the intermezzo in E major from the set of seven pieces, opus 116.
this is such a happy place to donate to in order to keep music and art alive and thriving in this lovely town of Ann Arbor.